Good. We have uh, nearly 30 minutes. I'm going to invite the, the uh, it's, I think, more useful for the audience, but also very useful for the panel. Come on up, because there's a lot of empty seats in the front. So don't be bashful. Just make your way up. Uh, those seats, even here in the front now, are open to all participants, right? There's not VIPs uh, that will block you. I think this is really interesting, because I've been in the energy sector for 30 years covering it. Uh, the last 10 years, including the transition and the renewable space. And I think one of the biggest challenges we have today is that ESG means different things to different regions of the world. And I'd love to start with all three of you on that. Uh, am I being wishful, Stacy, thinking that you can get a global standard? Uh, or is that okay? It doesn't have to be one size fits all. Uh, you're coming from uh, women in mining, but you're also an advisor to a number of uh, mining companies and those that work in that space. What do you think about trying to develop a global standard? Yeah, I think um, when it comes to ESG in particular, we're still trying to define and understand what ESG means to the various players. And not just in terms of uh, jurisdiction, but also in terms of the commodities in which we're uh, looking at and defining. So. Thinking of uh, an ESG standard and having that one, one size fits all standard, I think that's a little bit ambitious. And I think understanding that that's ambitious and might not happen in the next five years, maybe that's the, the way forward. And maybe that will add some comfort to the industry. But I think if we define ESG as something that is contextual, that is defined, um, by various players in various ways, then maybe that's how we, if we have that understanding, then that's how we can move forward. But if we're saying that ESG, we can have a one size fit all model, I think um, you might uh, lose a lot of the audience and yeah. Yeah, you know, it's interesting in the audience uh, today, we had people come up to me after the panel with Mike Henry of uh, BHP and he was saying, if you're not careful, it serves as a drag on CapEx, right? And then the exploration and development, Mark. Uh, what's the Bechtel experience and how does ESG fit in um, the E and the S, if you will, for Saudi Arabia and the projects that you're doing here? I would imagine, uh, from what I can hear, it's been taken very seriously. Yeah, and I think um, it's a great question. And I think one of the things we're seeing is it's a global business. And we are seeing our customers supply global standards and responsibilities across all their projects. So they're not, taking advantage of those relaxed standards. I think, um, and I think one of the things we talked about here is the acceleration. So those communities and standards with those people, in five years and 10 years, they're gonna be in the same place that the US and the, the UK is now. So, so I think those companies are approaching it in the right way. We see a similar standard. Uh, for all projects, and so it's good to see, and I think it's a responsible, I know. So you're, Marden, we haven't gone to the lowest common denominator is what you're saying? Correct, so if you look at Marden's title, it's responsible mining, and, uh, and so that's what they're doing. They're, doing, they're mining responsibly as if you do it anywhere in the world. Good, what are your views on this, Michelle, before we uh, take a deeper dive into the work that you're doing at Rice University about establishing what is a global benchmark, and does it hinder investment if somebody doesn't want to touch mine, I was thinking of the university endowments, for example, in the United States. In some cases, the student body doesn't think they should be supporting oil and gas. They don't, uh, shouldn't be in the mining space. And that, that disconnect between the mining industry and the energy transition, that it's vital. How do you see it yourself? So if you're talking about global standards within industries, like what would, what would be considered reasonable key performance indicators, KPIs, that's, that's the magic thing. Everywhere for mining magic. companies, <laughs> Yeah, for mining companies, that would make sense. And I think when this whole thing started, can I be blunt and we, frank? And you'd be surprised how blunt the kingdom so can especially, be. So especially thinking about American student bodies and endowments. Um, what, I, what I think is that these three magic words were actually intended to push industries out of business, frankly. Um, and, and instead, what of course we're trying to do is embrace them and figure out how to operationalize them in the extractive businesses, in oil and gas, fossil fuels in general, and in mining. Um, if there anybody who hasn't seen a Harry Potter movie, so you know the sorting hat, 
that's used to sort out the kids into the different colleges. And in, in my opinion, that's basically how this whole thing has been used. It's, it's the, the intention originally was to sort out uh, industries that just you know weren't acceptable because they didn't meet certain metrics. And the all defining one when it all started a few years ago was emissions, right? Because that was the easy target, you know, climate goals being what they are and everything else. So just to give you an idea of how complicated this has become, I, I don't use the word renewable anymore. I call it all alternative energy, alt energy, because in my book, there's nothing that's really renewable. Um, but when we look at these businesses, what we find is that their environmental footprints are enormous. And it's not just because of the material supply chains, it's because of everything that's involved in launching a grid scale wind and solar project. So you start unpacking this, now what's happening is this ESG mindset is making everyone unhappy with everything. So I don't know what exactly that's supposed to get us, but you know, that's, that's kind of a dilemma. So when you look at something like funds and university endowments, what everybody thought was, oh, this is easy, we'll just invest in wind and solar and the problem will be solved. Well, it doesn't work like that. Good, so is it part of an education? I'd love to have both of you address it. Mm -hmm. There is a disconnect between this industry today, as I brought up in the opening session, and uh, even with Mike, uh, when we had that fireside chat, uh, how do you, in the industry, connect with the populations and then it, hopefully, to Michelle's point here, get the environmental community to, to try to look for solutions? How do you think we can close that gap, Stacey? Um, I think, also, I just want to make one point that's really key to sure. to what Michelle said, is what you end up happening in that panic to address ESG is greenwashing, mm. and unintentional greenwashing at that. So, um, and when you have that, then the consumers are calling you out for it. Now, how do we communicate to the consumers, right? It's a very delicate conversation because consumers are leading the narrative in driving um, certain ESG indicators, especially when we look at critical minerals. And if we go further down the supply chain, we have car manufacturers who are struggling to keep up with this, the value chain and the definition of uh, responsible minerals, responsible supply chains because they can't account for the entire supply chain. So they're struggling with um, communicating what's this responsible um, mining, how do we uh, define ESG. So we have the consumers now taking it upon themselves to come up with these definitions and what they expect of the mining companies. Mm. And when you have these two uh, disparate I mean, approaches to trying to define ESG and define responsible mining, responsible sourcing, then that's where that push and pull comes. Now, the question you asked was, how do we communicate it, right? Um, it's involving a lot of the civil societies who are underground and working in perhaps a co-design forum in defining what that narrative, what that messaging is. So if you're not able to connect to your community, then you're not able to actually communicate or to have them on board or also have the companies on board to the needs and the issues within the communities. So it's how do we come up with a co-designed approach where communities are involved, civil societies, yeah. as well as the mining companies. Good, it, one of the things that we often talk about is scope one, two, and three in terms of emissions. Yep. And then how do you measure them and what are you responsible for, right? Are there other approaches, in your view, Mark, than, than using scope one, two, and three? What's the Bechtel view, and how is it in practice on the ground in the kingdom, for example? I, th I think, you know, when we talk about E and the ESG, that it's a lot more than just carbon. And, uh, and so I think when we look at projects, we look at a lot broader scope than uh, carbon emissions. I and mean, it's easy to measure your scope one and two. Three is quite complicated. But I think really from a project perspective and from a customer's perspective, we look at you know, zero waste, we look at that um, carbon content and mm -hmm. captured carbon content of the materials we use, whether that's low carbon uh, concrete, green steels, um, recycled materials. So we look at that in a big way. And I think also in Saudi, water minimization is one of the big things we look at in design. So Say that again. Water minimization. Oh, right, so of course. So it's a scarce resource. Uh, and so making sure that we use maximum water recycling 
um, and we manage that resource carefully because it's important to the industry. Absolutely. So. It's interesting, uh, Michelle, you made a point in the topics and when we have the conversation coming into the panels, you said uh, what companies are promising to do uh, and what they can really do and where they do it. This is another gap that we were just talking about with Stacy. What do you mean by that? Well, if, if the leaders in the industry could be frank, and some of them are increasingly frank, what they will say is that a lot of the solutions aren't available yet. There are a lot of ideas, there are a lot of things that people are talking about doing and trying to do, but they simply aren't in the market. Um, and then it takes time, even if they were in the market, to deploy them, to integrate them into mining operations and practices and all of that sort of thing. So, so there, is a, there is a gap between the tools, the actual physical tools, technology, um, management systems, data analytics, that kind of stuff are moving a little faster, but just the, you know, the hardcore options. And then the trade-offs are enormous. So if you look at a large-scale mining operation, iron ore, for example, um, to meet some of the emissions parameters, a desire is to electrify um, haul trucks, so that that's one solution. Um, coupling that with automation solves a second problem, safety. But now what you're doing is impacting workforce. Mm. So what hasn't happened in this is a conversation about how the implications ripple when it comes to dealing with communities, um, expectations about workforce and job creation and that sort of thing. You might be checking boxes, yeah. you know, on the technology end. Oh, oh, right, I'm getting fewer emissions and also right. I'm getting fewer lost time incidents, but I'm also creating fewer jobs. Now what? Right. You know, now that conversation with your, with your sovereign, with your host communities shifts. I don't think that part has been discussed at all. Mm. The, the linkages across these things. I want to spend one question. I'd love to hear all three of you on it on the issue of gender. I mean, you are in women in mining in the UK, so I think I'm going to start with you, Stacey, on it. Um, is that should that be part of the ESG conversation? Is that part of the social? Uh, how would you categorize it, and and why? Oh, definitely. And uh, I think, uh, as Michelle also just noted that we haven't actually spoken a lot about the, the talent pipeline, the social aspect, the social implications, but gender plays a significant role in uh, so many things, especially when we look at the correlation between women in leadership positions, for example, in mining and uh, impact on the environment or impact on um, board composition and then board, um, and then the actual governance structures of those mining companies. So gender, yes, it's a social aspect. It, we talk about social value, but it touches on so much more. It touches on the environmental aspects. It touches on the governance structures within the companies. And if we move beyond the board and we're looking at communities and how we engage, there are so many aspects of gender that we that presents significant risks to the mining companies. And if we're looking at ESG and defining it as this mechanism by which to mitigate risk, yeah. then I would say pay attention to your, your, gender, um, your gender approach and how you're looking at women in the industry and other. So, yes. Good, and, uh, and Mark, I'd like to have you, you know, Ailey was supposed to come from Australia, yep. right? And she had uh, COVID in the family, so she didn't take the trip. She told me she's been in, at Bechtel for 37 years yep. and is at the top of the food chain in terms of the company hierarchy, I think, as well. Uh, how is that seen within Bechtel, which is a very traditional engineering giant uh, around the world? How has it shifted at your time in the company and that sensibility that Stacy's uh, alluding to there, would you say? I think it's a really interesting question, John. And one of the things that surprised me, so, so I've spent my whole career working in the Middle East in a very male-orientated environment. And, uh, and so it was quite interesting for me. I've been working for AD now for uh, 12 months, and she's my boss. And actually, the number two, our CFO, is a female as well. So wow. two leaders of our mining organization are female. And it's probably the first time I've had a leadership team that shows compassion. And, uh, and it's a really radical change that I've not noticed before when you're dealing with all male um, colleagues. And so I think when we talk about ESG, if you've got 
that more balance, and people have talked about companies are more effective when they've got better gender balance in their whole cross section. And I think, you know, I think from an ESG perspective, that compassion piece um, will pay dividends in the future. So I think as we see that five, 10 year horizon, and we see that growth in um, gender balance, uh, moving towards the 50-50, which we all would love to achieve, then I think you'll see that shift in the organizations and projects. So. Good, do, do you want to jump in this debate, Michelle? You've got a lot of experience to, to, the, to bring to the fore. And is it the right debate uh, I worked in media for 35 years. Um, APCO Public Affairs was founded by a, a chairwoman who's now 76, great sensibilities. But we were always gender agnostic in media because we always had females or women uh, as leaders. Uh, wh what do you think about this debate within the mining sector? Frankly, in your experience, it was easier to do. Um, I think in terms of, of what people look for with that, it's, it's a governance side. I mean, I think socially, yes, Stacey's correct. You know, opportunities, everybody wants that. But when you look at um, some of what people are trying to encourage that's gender related, it's like how many women are in management? How many women are on boards? And you start seeing things like quotas and all of that. And that is like not the right way to do it. The tough thing is where it starts. So just, to give an example, a real life example, 45 years ago or however long it was, I was the only woman in my geoscience program at university. The only woman. You don't know how hard things are until you go to a geology field camp and you're the only woman in the field. I mean, that <laughs> is not convenient, I can, no. I can tell you. Um, but things, and this is the terrible news, things haven't actually improved that much, at least in the United States, much of Europe. I mean, we. Women are coming into the industry more, generally speaking, more. Um, they're in STEM programs more, but the percentages are still really low, really awful. Um, and I, myself, wouldn't put an emphasis on, on promoting women just to promote women unless I know that they're really well trained, technically proficient and everything else. So that hurdle, it's an early stage hurdle. Um, young women have to be interested in going into the STEM disciplines. They have to be interested in going into these industries. It came up earlier today. Um, if you're good at it, you work at it, you survive, you deserve, you know, the merit that, that comes along with it. But that's not how we're thinking about things right now. It's that, that's too slow and it's too uh, traditional or, you know, something to satisfy the environment that we're in. Good. I don't want to spend the, all the time, but I see you nodding and disagreeing at the same time. Mark, do you want to jump in? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I agree, and there are areas where I think it's a bit more complex because we do have to think about the unconscious biases that organizations have. The unconscious so, bias. Yes, okay, of course. Good. So <laughs> you have these uh, barriers for promotion within institutions. So as much as women would love to be in the industry, we have a very high drop-off rate. So retention is often a big oh, issue. Oh, that's interesting. That? They come in. That's, yes. I don't disagree with that. Yeah. Oh. So you have- They come in and disillusion? Is that what's happening? No. Well, the industry doesn't facilitate the many, many jobs that women have um, and the roles in which they play, not just in the company, but in society, in their homes. And these barriers breed life to various things, whether it's imposter syndrome, whether it's the inability to feel that they can actually fulfill their um, duties in, in their roles at home or in the office. So you have very talented geoscientists, mining engineers who leave mining and find other industries, take their talents elsewhere and find other industries that will give them other opportunities that they haven't been able to find. So I think a lot of that is the work-life balance. And I want the whole day, when we, the first initial plenary, Marna uh, Cote pointed that out. I mean, that is, that is a serious consideration. But in my household, my husband's rejoinder on these conversations is, there's a glass ceiling for men too. Thank you very much. <laughs> Not, I mean, you know, where you went to university, what your network is, who you know, it, it's, you know, it's still... It's, it's, it's more subtle than, than, than perhaps we are okay, aware let's of. Let's let the Lone Ranger in the middle here uh, weigh yeah, in. Yeah, you see whether he agrees debate, or disagrees. <laughs> so I suppose an interesting story. So I had a construction manager. We were recruiting graduates in Saudi. So this is about last year. 
and talking of quotas. So, so we said we really wanted to hire 60% female because we wanted to try and shift the needle. Uh, you were and, trying to get the 50%. Yeah. And so um, the construction manager said to me, that's not going to happen, not going to be possible. You know, it's a man industry. So we said, okay, interview the people, do it on merit. Don't, don't do it on anything else, do it on merit. And he came back to me and he said, actually, I could have had 100% female because mm -hmm. the candidates were so strong, they were really keen to work. There are those And so, so I think the, it, it's an interesting balance about quotas and, and demographics. But I think Saudi is primed for growth. So oh, I my think, gosh. You know, they, they, what they've unleashed here in terms yeah. of the female talent is mind-boggling. I sit in meetings where there's 80% women yeah. and they're calling the shots. What are your final thoughts on this? No, it, it's fantastic to see the movement of the women in mining uh, narrative here. You know, the Ministry of Mines has a women in mining committee with which uh, WIM UK have uh, spoken to them about how uh, to structure, but they've taken that beyond what we do, right? They're embedded in policy, they're doing um, a lot of work around education, how do we develop skills? And what is the, what does a woman minor on site looks like? Is that something that Saudi women want at the moment, right? So we talked about the drop-off rate of women who are working on site because the- of Well, I visited both Aramco events. here, which you, you know, it's a, a global brand, but if you go out to the facilities in, in the Eastern province, Adnoc in the field, you know, in Abu Dhabi, female engineers, female explorers, female rig, rig workers. I mean, it's not something you've seen 10 years ago, but it's a revolution. I think you'd agree yeah, with yeah. that. The final point I wanted to ask, and I'll, I'll pose it to Michelle, I, I get frustrated looking at the language within the COP community, for example, and then we have this language within the ESG community, mm -hmm. And I think it's a language that's comfort in, it's comfortable with inside the tent, but is it getting the objectives to net zero by 2050? There's a lot of, I don't want to be like, you know, Greta and say there's a lot of blah, 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 but it's not communicating with the consumers anymore. I don't know if you agree with what I'm suggesting, Michelle, but even on the ESG conversation, and if you want to wrap it, Stacey, we can. Very quickly, if you can, Michelle, do you think? I don't have a quick answer for that one. <laughs> But it's complex. I, I, I don't know. Okay, so everybody's got this goal of net zero. I'm not even sure half the time that I know what it is that they're that's trying to do. That's a problem. So that's, that's problem number one. Um, but, but I also think that um, a lot of choices are getting made to promote certain things that are viewed to be solutions that actually don't make any sense when you look at them on a really harsh level playing field, full life cycle, you know. And, and I think we would be surprised but at the results if we were really fair in our evaluation and our assessment of that. And the clock's ticking against <laughs> us, uh, not uh, in just the stage, but in the goals to get there is the biggest problem. We'll have to continue the debate uh, behind the scenes, but Stacey Hope, yeah. Mark, it's great to have you. I, I really appreciate you jumping in because yeah. of Ailey's inability to get here. Mark Ashwin and Michelle, Michelle Foss uh, joining us from Rice University. Can we give them a nice round of applause, please? Thank you very, very much. Thanks.